Yo, it's Jason Avant here, one half of the Q&A show. I'm here with my man, Quint Michael. We are back and we are ready to talk about the Eagles' upcoming season, talk about the draft, talk about the players. We're just ready to have a good time. Q, how you doing, my man? Let's talk to the fans. <laughs> What's up, man? I'm doing great, man. Um, you know, we, we had a spring break with the kids, got some, uh, some time around the house, just hanging out, enjoying the sun. Had some okay weather, but uh, for the most part, having fun, man. Just can't wait to get ready and can't get can't wait to get into it, man. So let's go. <laughs> cool. I, you know what? It's spring break for me over at Launch Trampoline Park, man. And these kids be running me around <laughs> all day. Not only my kids, but all of your kids and everybody else. It's it's a fun time, but you know, trying to keep up with a bunch of eight year olds for for about eight to nine hours is pretty tough. But <laughs> we we pressing through. <laughs> there you go, man. I don't got the knees for it no more. <laughs> hey, I know, shot. right? Didn't did, didn't you have some a special event that happened last week? Were you coaching or something like that last week? How did that go? Or I, I didn't know. Did, you were telling me you were telling me something that happened last week. So, uh, so uh, I'm trying to think what um, last week. Last week I didn't really. Didn't no, really you say you, you said last week. Show you had some some news that you were going. I I don't know. It was something <laughs> along those lines. All right, so that that could be me and, and, and my faulty imagination there. See, charge that up to me chasing kids around all week. All right. <laughs> so, but back to the fans. All right, we want to say thank you guys for tuning in. So. Um, very much. Um, and we also would like to just just give you guys acknowledgement. We know that you reach out to us on social media. You reach out to us in passing in so many different forms um, to let us know that you like our show. We really appreciate your feedback. We take the positive along with the negative and the criticism, all the constructive, anything in between. We want to let you know that we're thinking about your questions. We're trying to um, pose new thoughts and ideas for the show. So we want to say thank you guys for tuning in. Remember, every Wednesday at 6 a.m., it drops. Every um, uh, Wednesday at 6 a.m. inside the Burst platform, YouTube, social media channels, Amazon Music, um, so many different ways. Thanks to Adam and Jeff for um, having us. And Q, you're doing a great job. And I just want to say thank you for, for sharing in the show with me, man. Yes, sir, man. Appreciate it. Love it. Let's go. Let's get let's into go. it. <laughs> All right, let's get into it. All right, here we go. All right, so let's talk about Jim Johnson, right? Because we haven't had a stable defense. We've had the run where we won the Super Bowl. And, and Jim Schwartz put together a magnificent run, especially playing with underestimated um, and underrated players, quote unquote, or some people would say less talented players. Right. You got the Darby's and um, Jalen Mills and that team that had some clear deficiencies on defense, especially at the cornerback position, ended up winning the Super Bowl. But when you start to compare that defense and the defenses of the Buddy Ryan's and the Jim Johnson, where there was stable cornerback play, where there was stable defensive line play and safety play throughout the whole of their you know defensive career how do, can we get back to that point and why do you think that Jim Johnson's defense was so effective when you get guys like Lito that was playing out of his mind for two or three seasons you had a guy that was as solid as a, a second corner that the Eagles have ever seen in Sheldon Brown you had the ones before that with Al Harris and Bobby Taylor and Troy Vincent um you had these cornerbacks that this is our history. And then over the last five to seven years, man, we can't get a safety or cornerback in the draft that's panning out. We're getting guys that are failing each and every year. How can we get back to the Jim Johnson times? Can you tell me? You played for him. You saw the <laughs> defense. You saw the, the genius. Tell me, how can we get back there? Well, you know, that's that's a good question. Um, Jim, man, I have so much respect for Jim Johnson. You know, the guy was just uh, – a, a wizard when it came to mm -hmm. to um you know not only scheming up um blitzes but also knowing the right times to call them i, I think that's an underrated part of, mm -hmm. of, of what he what he brought to the table and um you know it's it's funny <laughs> but i think the thing the first time I'm, i i was thinking about this and um when you when you brought it up the first time i i really um got 
I guess what I should say, um, my my full Jim Johnson experience. <laughs> um, so if, if anyone that knew Jim, you know, got got rest his soul. Um, anyone that knew him knew, like you can know you can mess up a couple, you know, coverages or a couple plays, but if you mess up them blitzes, <laughs> it's a wrap. It's a wrap. Like those are his babies, right? You cannot mess up his blitzes. And I remember my first time. Um, uh, it was my first training camp. You know, I'm, I'm a rookie free agent, didn't get a whole lot of reps. And um, I was supposed to blitz on a play. And I, I knew, I, I thought I knew I was supposed to blitz, but I wasn't sure. So I just didn't, I didn't blitz, right? So just yeah. totally blew it, blew it up. So Jim, Jim calls me over to the sideline. He's like, hey, do you know what you're doing on that, on that call? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, he's like, what are you supposed to do? And I said, I'm supposed to blitz. And he, <laughs> he goes, well, an effing blitz. And just like it was the complete like it, it caught me so off guard because he went from like you know what you're supposed to do on that play like like really like <laughs> quiet and like like coach you what like I'm I'm about to coach this guy but think, think he's gonna coach me up and then he's like then effing blitz and he turned around and walked away didn't say mouth okay. like I just stood there like okay like I <laughs> learned my lesson <laughs> learned like real. if I mess up on anything. If I mess up on anything, it ain't gonna be no more than you know. Yeah. <laughs> that was it. But yeah, no, he was a great he was a great coach, and I, I think the thing that that was um, great about him um, is that he wouldn't he would go into a game um, and he would he wouldn't necessarily blitz just a blitz. He would attack your your um, your blitz your uh, protections. Like he yeah he would figure out um, you know if you're doing man pro gap pro slide scan pro whatever as a as an offensive line protection unit and he would he would attack the scheme that you tried to use to block and that's what one of the things that i think was so underrated about him is the timing of the blitzes and the way he used his his schemes and his brain to figure out the best way to attack um, a blocking scheme and nine yeah. times out of ten he figured it out after the first snap and it was a wrap from there so, yeah that's 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 pretty that's pretty high level and for a lot of fans out there um, when, when she was talking about attacking the, the offensive lines, like blocking scheme based on, you know, the defensive front, the, the offensive line will block and they have a count. And if you can distort or mess up that count, you're going to have a guy that's running free. And there's a weakness in every offensive lines protection scheme at some point. And if you're a defensive coordinator that can figure that out fast, you're going to make them do something different, which plays into your hand or you're going to get home to the quarterback a bunch so Jim Johnson was the master at it if you were in some type of scat where it's a five-man protection and there was a weak a weak link he would find it he would get the best person on the weakest link um and and you know I thought it was amazing I, I remember one time where this man went zero blitz about five or six times in a row I was like is this guy and it was in a fourth quarter with the game online I'm like this dude has big balls like big like because because like you go zero and you mix it up you go zero you show it and then you come out and cover four like you switch it up you just don't line up in and say look I'm gonna we ended up getting beat that game but I never it was the game when Eli came back and um and place go call like the game winner on yeah. show in the left corner yeah, um, I remember that at game. home at home but yeah. and we were up by a bunch but he zero blitz like the last six or seven plays of the game and even though we lost I can remember going out saying you know what coach Reed always says you know, um, you know, fear nothing and attack everything. Like yeah. we tried to win that. He was trying to win the game. Yeah. And I don't get, I don't, I don't mind that in a defensive coordinator. If you're trying to win the game with with dialing up pressure and your and your guy fails, okay. But if you're sitting back in a sticks defense and just letting guys catch yards and, and, and getting down, trying to stop them in the red, listen, let let me fire somebody up, light somebody up. And I respect that respect that a bunch by Jim Johnson. Yeah. And I'm gonna add a little bit to that too. You know, one of the things that um I, I really respected about Jim was that like that that kind of jarred my memory when you talked about that play with Plaxico. Jim, after that play, um, and and anytime, so let's 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 back up a little bit. Anytime that you did exactly what he asked you to do coverage wise, blitz wise, and let's say the play like a play like Sheldon, that play, yeah. he he played the perfect coverage. He did exactly what Jim taught him to do. Plaxico made a made a big play and the game was over. They they scored. Jim he 
he'll never ever he he would never come down on you if you did what you were coached to do and they just made a play and wow. i had nothing but respect for him wow about that like if you if you came on a blitz and you were supposed to blitz and you did everything you're supposed wow. to do and you got picked up he just no no, no problem See, that's that's respect. And that's it. Like I said, that's a different level because there's always this going on in the National Football League because jobs are on the line. And it's not just the National Football League. It's every big corporation. It's the NFL. It's IBM. It's whatever corporation it may be, Apple, whoever it is. Something goes wrong and you start to see guys like this. But when your defensive coordinator and I remember that so vividly of him going down while Sheldon was pissed. Sheldon was mad because he's like, dude, we just went zero seven straight times in the game when the touchdowns on him so everybody's like what is Sheldon doing I remember Jim Johnson walking down toward the end zone meeting Sheldon at about the 15 putting his arm around him and walking him back into the tunnel saying you know what my fault I yeah. put you in that situation and it was it was one too many times but I don't I'm not reprimanding you for that I actually called it up you got beat on it so what? But most coaches are going to be like, you got to play this technique this way. No <laughs> one good and well that the cut that the route in this particular instance was way better than the coverage that was presented. And um, and most guys won't live with that. I, I've had coaches that, you know, in cover two man where the guys banked hard inside and they call a slant and you went on it six out of seven times, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But the coverage is geared to the defense. Instead of them yelling and saying, "You know what, we need to call a better play," they're like, "Come on, Avant, you can't." I'm like, "Dude, yeah. what do you what do you want to do?" And and most coaches are like that because they're trying to point and and pass the book. Yeah. So I respect that. And so for and I'll, I'll kind of break down that cover two. So cover two man for for the for the fans at home, um, it's just a two deep um, two deep safeties. And what happens a lot of times is you're you have a corner and a nickel. They'll press. The um, press coverage, which is bump and run, and a lot of times they'll play underneath. So, like if I'm if I'm guarding if I'm guarding you, Jason Avant, I'm going to jam you and then let you run up the field because now I know I have a safety over top. Yeah. And so what it what it ends up becoming, if you can visualize it, is a sandwich where where I'm the underneath. Um, Jason would be the middle, aka the the meat or whatever, and then the safety would be the top piece of the bread or the, yeah. the top bun or whatever. So. That's what two man coverage is, and versus slant, it's all day. <laughs> it's because you're trying. To, they they don't want to get beat inside right away, right? Because right. that's the thing. They would rather you go outside because they can channel you and get another defender with the sideline. But yeah, so let's let's go to the next state, the step of that. Let's talk about it, right? So we had Lido playing at a high level. We had Sheldon playing at a high level. How can we get our corners right? Because those guys with this one, yeah, they hit on some picks, right? Mm -hmm. They hit on those guys. These guys weren't foreign. They came up in the ranks, and that's the best type of player that we can get as an organization. I love D. Slay. I love Asante Samuel. I love all the ones that we picked up, even from the DRCs, and I got love for 90 and all of those guys, right? You pick up those guys because they had some success in their career, but somewhere um, along the line, those old habits are going to creep back in, and it's going, it, it's going to create some type of division with what the farm-raised guys that have been drafted there um, are trying to do. So if you get the guys that have been drafted that grew up in the system, that trust the system, they're going to be better. So Lito was successful. Sheldon was successful. Al was successful. Um, you know, Troy was successful. Um, Bobby was like all of these guys. So how can we get back to that point? And, and, and what was the secret sauce when it came to that? Well, you know, that's... I, it's tough, man, because honestly, I feel like those those guys like Lito and Sheldon in any system, I feel like they would have been successful. I mean, those guys were just they're just kind of they were cut, cut different. And um, what we're seeing lately with a lot of the changes in the NFL, um, it's it's tough. It's tough to play um, lights out defense. You can barely you know, you can barely put your hands on the receivers nowadays. You can barely, you know, get away with tackling nowadays. So. Um, it's it's a tough question, and I, I do think it, it starts really in the draft. And as you as you mentioned, when you're bringing in a guy, quote unquote mercenary, you're bringing in a guy from another team. As you said, you're bringing in other, you know, past habits, right? Stuff that mm -hmm. that may or may not you may or may not like. Um, when you when you're building through the draft and you're drafting the right guys, you have a blank slate in terms of building building your 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 cornerback and not just the, the cornerback and safety position but really like building building that meeting room building mm -hmm. that that 
brotherhood and and that's where it starts and so I think it starts with with evaluating um players the right way potential draft picks the right way not necessarily looking at their speed and their measurables you know looking at the tape um are they afraid to tackle are they physical if they get beat on the plate do they come back and and still play or do they go in the tank um do they still play aggressive if they if they do get beat, do they play aggressive if the game's on the line? So I think you have to really kind of evaluate all that because you can look at the numbers. Everybody can go and run a 4-2-40 and not everyone, but, you know, it's easier to run a 4-2-40 if you're in shorts. Like, how do you move when you have pads on? Like, how does, how does he tackle? So I think that at the end of the day, um, we have you as a, as a person making the picks you have to look at the tape and you have to look at the workouts and you have to see which what meshes right what can we can we guess that when this person puts the pads on will they be able to do what what they look like they can do so okay. it's you know it's it's a tough it's a tough question um yeah the good thing is that I do think that there's a lot of talent in this draft I do think that at the the defensive back position I think there's some players that can definitely come in and, and help and, um, you know, hopefully build a scheme that suits them. I don't think, I don't think, you know, I, like I said, I love Coach Schwartz, but I don't, I don't know if he really um, has a scheme that's really con conducive for mm. this, the secondary. I mean, his, his, mm. his defense is based on the D line, getting pressure. The D line. Right? Yeah. And so, you know, my hope is that with Gannon, you know his he's he's a he's a defensive back guy. He's he's coached under Zimmer. Um, my hope is that he's able to develop a, a better relationship with the secondary because in 2020 2021, it's all about that back seven. I mean, it's good to have a good pass rush, but if your guys in the back can't cover, it's a wrap. It, it's a wrap. And and what Q is saying there, right? So just conventional, right? When you start talking about Coach Schwartz, you start thinking about Washburn, Fisher, and all of those guys, they used to always use this term that we're going to stop the run on the way to the quarterback, meaning that pass rushing was the number one thing. They would get into a Y9 technique and they would rush the quarterback and the guys had pretty much free reign, the defensive front, to do what they needed to do in order to get to the quarterback. That's why you see us get as the bunch because our defensive linemen, especially the defensive ends, seem like they're in the wrong place at the wrong time. And they don't have, we're not as assignment pure up front because we want those guys to get to the quarterback, right? So what that does is, is that it puts a lot of pressure on the linebackers and on the safeties. And then you add the element of, I don't like to blitz. Therefore, if those guys are front, you're putting all the responsibility, the weight of the team is on your front four. And if those guys aren't getting home because it's designed for them, the secondary is stressed. The linebackers are stressed in the run game. You got to, it's just too many gaps. It's too much responsibility for um, if, those, if those front, those front four aren't balling. And last year they didn't ball. And that's just true. Like Fletcher has some ups and he has some downs. He was hurt. He was in and out. He's a baller consistently. He's our best player. But if they're double teaming him and we don't get 9, 10, 11, 12 sacks out of somewhere, somebody else, consistently and you have Barnett that was down half the year like it's very very hard on the secondary so we have to invest those that time um in that and evaluating these guys and we got some good players in this draft some guys that can change your franchise we got Patrick Sertan we got JC Horn we got Caleb Farley um we got the uh there, there's there's a, a, another few guys that are in the second round we got um Asante Samuel Jr we got a bunch Thanks of different Stokes. guys yeah. yeah, so yeah, so so Q out of the guys that are that are available in the draft, which style of player do you think will be beneficial to us? Seeing that we do have a Darius Slate, which is a slender mem uh, mirror, follow guys around type of guy. Do you think we need to get someone opposite of him, which is more of a a, a true strong stout guy um, that has some size, or do you think we need um, another type of corner? What do you think about that? Yeah, that's a good question. I think um, based on based on um, what I what I saw from from uh, Slay last year, um, I I think I think he had a 
I think he had a, a pretty good season. I mean, they were asking him to do a lot. And, you know, at, at his age of, what is he, 20, 29? Yeah, he's about to be 30, 30. I, I th- he may be, I think he's 30. I think he's 30. Yeah, I think he's 30. I think he's 30. And that, you know, at his age, um, you know, getting up there a little bit. And so mm-hmm. maybe it, maybe it's not great for have, to have him kind of traveling with, with the best receiver as much, you know. Um, so I think, I think um, assuming that, you know, he's got a couple years left, I, I think with, a, with Gannon, based on what I'm guessing, the system is going to be told, kind of like a cover two um, hybrid type defense where, you know, it's a little bit more zone. Um, definitely, hopefully, a little bit more pressure. I'm I'm saying that we're gonna need to get a guy. That, now, my favorite my favorite corner in the draft, and I do like Farley. I think Farley, athletically, is superior to anyone. I mean, the guy's got great size, speed, athleticism. Um, he can catch up with anybody. He's, in my opinion, he's strictly a, a, a outside corner. He kind of reminds me of of D'Angelo Hall and. And I don't want to say that because they went to the same school, but, yeah. but mm-hmm. he's, he's, he's got good size. He's got tremendous speed, uh, more of a straight line guy, but not as quick. So, you know, he's, he's a guy that I, I feel that when he's playing off, off coverage, he's going to have a little bit of trouble with the short, quicker, uh, more um, seasons route runners. I think he's going to have a little bit of trouble there, but if you put him in press and say, just, just take him out, you know, I think he'll be totally fine there. So um I, I do like Farley, but my favorite cornerback is Sertain just because I just he's just a technician. Like he just does he does everything the right way. He tackles, he's square, he he plays, you know, he plays cover two the right way, he plays cover three, he plays man. I just think that across the board, I think he's a he's a corner that can come in and give you some very good minutes and play any kind of coverage that you need. And he's well coached. So I, I do like that about him. Q. You're preaching to me right now. See, this is the type of player that the Eagles historically will pass on. And this is the type of player that I will punch my television screen. I will completely obliterate the television if they pass on him and he's there. Barring some of the the headline offensive guys, those guys sell tickets, they help you win, all those things. But a guy like this, if Jamar Chase and, um, and, and, and Kyle Pitt, like if they're going, okay, does anybody have this a chance at this guy? Because he player. Yes. And a lot of that has to do with his dad. Yes. Being, and, 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 and I want you guys to just really, really like wrap your mind around this. When you have a kid that's, going to be better than a pro consistent pro bowl player that's saying something to want to to want that pressure that my dad was a pro bowler and known around the nfl and you want to be in that shadow that takes some cojones that (laughs) takes some heart a lot of kids do not want to try to live up to what my dad did because all of the pressure but this kid is like, I'm going to take this on. And you can see it in his play. This kid has been groomed to be this. This yeah. is on, this the only thing that he knows. And he does everything well. He's square when he tackles. He finds the football. He knows when to look. He's, he's going to get a lot of picks just because he's in the right position. Shoots with the right hand. He really doesn't have too many flaws when you watch him when he plays. And he's not a sexy player. Whenever you have a guy that's like a technician out there, it's not a splash player. It's not a Farley where he runs real fast. He's big and he's he's a splash player. No, you you have a, a higher upside, right? You have a, a a Kevin Garnett upside. But look, I want the championship. Give me Tim Duncan, the big fundamentals, and that's who Sertan yeah. is. He's like okay, he's not the sexiest player, but he's gonna be there. He's gonna be in your organization for twelve years, starting corner for the Philadelphia Eagles, so you should go ahead and grab him. Yes. I Like, and, and I, and, and if he, and like, when you have a sure thing, get the sure thing. Yes. Everything else has got, like, Micah Parsons, um, you know, Jalen Phillips, uh, you know, Devontae, even Devontae Smith. Like, there's still a lot of question marks. In the first round, I'm going with a player that's going to be with my organization for yes. the next 10 years. That's what that's what I would do. I don't know nothing. 
<laughs> hopefully, man. Hopefully, he's still there. You know, I, I hope. I hope he's still there. If he's there, we we definitely gotta take him. You know who I like? I, I like J.C. Horn. The thing that I don't like about J.C. Horn is that you know I, I like his size. I like um, his ability to be at the line of scrimmage, but I don't like that that he that he doesn't find a football. Like I, yes. I don't think that he finds like I don't think that he locates the football good enough to be a first round. And that's my that's my top priority. If you're going to be drafted at corner in the first round, you got to do two things really well. You have to be able to eliminate a receiver and or you got to be a high. Um, I said one or two things. So you got to be able to eliminate a receiver and or get the ball back at a high level. And I don't necessarily know if he does though, either one of those things. Great. But he has all the measurables. and A lot of guys are high on him because he can run. He's big and he, and he can beat you at the line of scrimmage. But he doesn't locate the ball and his hips are tight. Yes. Uh, like it, it, and when your hips, when your hips are tight, you have to be a dominant player at the line of scrimmage, and he is. Um, it just worries me because you start to get into you know the Rasul Douglases and the other guys. Now I'm not saying that he's that because he can run so much better, but we have tight hips. When those hands get down, you can't make it up. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 I agree with you 100 percent on on J C Horn. Um, I I do think that athletically he's he's phenomenal phenomenal but again I, I'm not and I don't think he tackles very well I don't think he's very physical um and I just not not to sound like I'm hating on him but I just I just don't see him being that guy for for very long yeah. like as a at, at, as a number one pick as a first round pick I just I, I don't see it but you know stranger stranger things have happened before you know the guy is a phenomenal athlete you know, if you look at him, he looks the part. Um, great pedigree is that. Maybe people don't know his dad is uh, Joe Horn, great receiver for the Saints for many years. Um, so, you know, honestly, though, I, I I wouldn't be surprised if he <laughs> if he's there, if the Eagles pick him. Um, I, I personally think Sertan's a better um, pick, but, you know, you never you know. Nev- you just, you just <laughs> never know. No. You just never know. Now, back in 2017 is when you first got your start, and, and Coach Harris went from special teams to the defensive back coach, right? So let's transition into we're going to talk about this is the Q segment where we're going to talk about the Q oh, man. himself. <laughs> in 2017, Coach Har Coach Harris became you know the the defensive back coach when he was always the special team special teams guy, and, and Harris was tough, man. Like I don't know if he was a tough defensive back coach. He loved you because you were like the best on special teams. But me, that was just, yeah, I don't special teams. Hearts hated my guts at the beginning. I remember him telling me that. <laughs> I don't know how you made this team. We wanted darn near in McCann. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Harz was known for saying some crazy stuff like that, man. He didn't care. <laughs> uh, but I don't know how you made this team. I show I want to down there every weekend. I was like, dang, you you in that room with another 53 people or another 52 people, you feel about that big when you say something like that. Like, man, I, this, I hate this dude. <laughs> so tell me what it was like playing for Coach Harz. He's had some some amazing success. Another one of Andy's disciples. How does that like? How 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 was he as a, as a coach and 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 did you prefer him to be your defensive back coach? How was? So yeah, we we um, I was only one year and it was um it wasn't it wasn't 2017. Um, oh, I said 17. No, yeah, I, I read that, that, that could have been um, 17. That was too far. That that had to be. I'm with. trying to. I can't well, even. Think. I think it was 2000. I think it was 2007. No. 2007. That's how old I am, man. Yeah. No, somewhere yeah, it's somewhere around know, there, that's but the, that's the type on our paper. It could be two thousand. Yeah. Okay. And so, yeah. So he, it was weird. He, he, um, you know, he was he was the special teams coordinator, and then he had never really worked with the secondary, and yeah, um, he had switched over to um, the secondary that year, and we it was Coach McDermott was more like with the safeties, and Harbaugh was more with the. The, the cornerbacks so it was it was a little bit odd because he hadn't he hadn't had much experience with with us before in terms of the the secondary but coaching is coaching and Harbaugh knows you know he knows how to coach and um, obviously he had to learn some things on the run on the fly mm-hmm. that year was 
that was year was the year I ended up. So the, the start of the year was Sean Considine was the starter at the beginning of the year. And yeah. eventually I moved into the starting spot. And, um, you know, it was, it was a great year. It was, it was a fun year for me. It was my first year starting and, and, uh, it was, it was good, but thinking back, I just remember it, it was just like a really awkward feeling because, you know, he, <laughs> it's he, hard he was, it was like, he was, he, it, yeah, it was like, he was still learning. He was still learning the drills and learning how to, um, you know, call the defense and talk to the players. And, you know, when you're a special teams coach, you have to, you have to you have to deal with everybody, right? You got to deal with the O line linemen, the D linemen. You know, you you deal with the maybe the only maybe quarterback is probably the only position you don't really work with. So, mm -hmm. as a special teams coordinator, you get to kind of meet with everyone. So, when he came over to the secondary, it was just a I just remember this odd feeling in there, like it just was. I can't put a finger on it. It was like what well, it just it just I'm it was like tell, a, I'm, I'm it didn't really tell you fit what it was. Everybody <laughs> thought that look, man, this is some type of hire to get this man yes. a job and get him out of here, and it wasn't a, a sound hire. So most guys, and, and you go through that as a coach, like um, and as a player, sometimes you got to have a rapport, you got to have some some history to back you up. Otherwise, guys gonna be looking at you like what? Like you were <laughs> telling us to run down on kickoff yesterday, and now you are a coach. Coaching yeah. to the corners, like man, we don't have coach. Like we gotta make up our own stuff. So I'm pretty sure I want to see your your your. But I'm gonna uh, tell you. I'm gonna tell you that <laughs> what and you know I I what I do think um made a huge difference was you know having Dawkins, you know a veteran guy, uh, uh you know future Hall of Famer really buy in, and I think the way Doc bought in made it an easier transition for for um, Coach Harbaugh to to be able to coach us. And he is always, he always said, and he said the same thing to Sean McDermott, like coach me like you would coach one of these rookies. So, you know, we kind of follow suit with that. So that helped a little bit. Now that's a leader <laughs> indeed. I don't know if we ever had a receiver that was like, yo, coach me like you coach. Nah, <laughs> you know, we, we, you know, receivers over here, you know, there's a whole diva section over there. <laughs> I don't know how, man. Sometimes that's a, person, that's a personality room. You have to, be able to <laughs> deal with personalities. Just think about like your your most famous celebrity, like, and put all of them in the same room. That's how it is. There's a lot of personalities. There's a lot of stuff that you got to deal with. <laughs> I, can't, I can't even imagine, man. I can't imagine. I used to want to just sneak in y'all y'all meeting room sometimes, just sit in the back and just listen. Like, man, look, look what y'all be doing in here. Like, <laughs> it would go. It would, it would go like this. Y'all understand? Jason, get, get him lined up. <laughs> oh, That's too funny, you know man. Jason, get him lined up. Hey, Jay, Coach Kelly pulled me in there. Hey, listen, you got to get him. You got to get him lined up. You got to get him. <laughs> Shoot, man. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um, let's, let's take a quick break right here, um, Q. And um, for this break, it's brought to you by Launch Trampoline Park, come on out to Launch Trampoline Park in Denver, New Jersey. We have everything that your kids would dream about when it comes to entertaining, entertaining fitness for the whole family. And again, it's Launch Trampoline Park in Denver, New Jersey. Um, stop by, check me out, ask for me. Um, I'll see you, out, see you out there. I'll beat you in battle beam, basketball, dodgeball, <laughs> flipping, whatever you want to do. I'll kick your tail in. So um, <laughs> that's our break, and it's sponsor, sponsored by Launch Trampoline Park. Um, we're going to take a, a, a brief second, and we're going to come back again for part two. And we're back from our break, ready for part two. In this second part, Q, we're going to talk about Jonathan Gannon. We talked about it a little bit last week, and we talked about the scheme, some of the things that he could possibly do. But let's talk about his scheme. Let's talk about the players that he's had in his scheme um, when it comes to Zimmer, um, defense. And he had Eric Kendricks. He had Anthony Barr. He had Harrison Smith. He has some ballers over there. It's not, it's not hard to make any, you know, um, defensive coordinator um, or, you know, defensive specialist, coach, or whatever you want to call it, look good when you have that type of talent around you. So what do you think we need in our system? Now, look, let me give you some personnel that we have. We don't have Eric Kendrick. We're talking about sideline to sideline, pro bowl type of player. One of the better inside linebackers in the National Football League. We got TJ Ward, who is a bruiser 
but doesn't run left to right really well and has some limitations in the pass game. And then you got a young kid in Davion Taylor, which has some promise, very fast, very explosive. But again, he's limited when it comes to um, cover skills and things of that nature. So what do you think we need? You think we're going to go out there, a guy that's going to be, um, uh, you know, there's a few guys. We're, and we'll let you discuss those guys. Go ahead, Q. Yeah, you know, um, I think I think if if he does run a, the, the Zimmerman uh, types or the Zimmer um, type of system, um, I do think we're going to need a couple upgrades at, at linebacker just because um, that scheme, you've got to have some linebackers that can run. You've got to have some linebackers with great instincts. You've got to have some linebackers that are multifaceted, meaning they can blitz, they can, um, they can drop into coverage, and they can also fill when they need to fill. And, and those linebackers in, in, um, in Minnesota were tremendous at it. So um, looking at you know, our linebacking core, we've got Sean Bradley coming back, TJ Edwards, Alex Singleton, um, Davion Taylor. So I, I think Alex, I think Alex Singleton will be will be fine. Um, he's got very good speed. Um, he he diagnoses well. He can get downhill when he needs to. Um, I, I think that he can fit in nicely at one of the outside backer spots. Um, I think TJ. I'm gonna stop you there, right in the middle. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna stop you right there in the middle. So, for the fans out there, what Q is saying that okay, Alex, Alex, um, uh, Singleton, Singleton um, can be at one of the outside linebacker spots. Now, what the off uh, the outside linebacker spot, what, what it forces you to do to be is to be great at coverage. So you're telling me that Alex Singleton is going, Alex Singleton is going to be able to hold up in coverage against the line uh, against the tight end at times against a guy like Alvin Kamara that's coming out of the backfield because the, the 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 outside linebacker, the weak side linebacker is basically the nickel defender in base. So that's that guy that's on the field. And usually that guy is the guy that moves to the mic in third down or nickel situations. So you're telling me that Alex Singleton is going to be able to do all of those things for us. I think he can. I think I heard, we heard it first right here. <laughs> we heard it right here. I, because ath <laughs> athletically, he's he can move. I, I was actually I was, I was surprised. I watched the tape, and you know he was dropping in the coverage. He's running the middle and in, in cover two. You know Tampa two, and um, I, I do think that he now sub packages. I I imagine him coming off the field. So I'm looking at him more as a sandbacker. So. I'm not necessarily sold on him as a as a will. I think he could do it in spot, you know, in spots here and there. But I do think I see him more as a sandbacker where, you know, okay. you're dropping, you know, you're not necessarily locking on on the star tight end all game. So I do think that he can do that. Um, okay. And, you know, I do think it could be a situation where it's a stopgap for, you know, a year. And then maybe next year we, we find the guy at that position that that really wants. But. This kind of leads me to the main point. We need a we needed a mic backer. We need another mic, like an athletic mic backer that can come in day one and run this type of defense. I don't see that player on this roster right now. Mm -hmm. I don't see a mic backer that is athletic enough to drop into coverage um, and also be able to fill, be able to run sideline to sideline, be able to blitz, be able to do all the things that I imagine the system would be um, if it's a Zimmer. Um, type system um, and judging from what I saw with the uh, Colts last year you know even even the Colts linebacker play was was tremendous and, and they did they asked a lot from their linebacking core so um, I do think that we we, we should be looking at um, you know getting a, a new mic um, and there's this is actually a really good draft for that there's there's some good talent in the draft at, at, at mic position and my favorite my favorite is Guy out of Tulsa, Zavon, Zavion. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know how to pronounce it, but yeah. I, I say Zavion Collins. That's what Zavian I say. Zavion Collins. Say yes. Yeah. I put I put the tape on this guy. He flies to the ball. He diagnoses mm -hmm. well. He's got great instincts. He can cover. He will light you up. He and looks like Levar Arrington. Out there. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> he's, he's like huge. <laughs> <laughs> he's huge and and uh you know he's coming from Tulsa which isn't necessarily um considered um it's not necessarily considered uh it's not like the Alabamas of the world but you know good players can come from anywhere and um I I think that he's going to be a steal um you know I, I don't think people are really looking at him 
as a, a first round uh, pick right now. So hopefully if he, if he slides down to two or three, you know, two second or third round, if we can get him, if he's still there, I like him. I, I think he's a tremendous player and he's definitely going to be an upgrade. Yeah. So the, the guy, the guy that, sorry about that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm having technical difficulties over here. <laughs> <laughs> um, the guy that Q's talking about in Xavier, How in Xavier Collins is a young man that is six four and is built. Um, he, he looks like an old screw throwback linebacker that played in. He, he, he's just a different breed, can run. He's, uh, I just have, I, I don't know when the last time I seen a guy that big out there playing, maybe Erbach, like because guys that big are usually you know they're, they're not out there that much. Um, and, and that's a very, very dangerous thing to have, especially in the past game. Q, you know who I like? I like Zayvon Collins as well. You talked about him briefly. Um, he's a big guy. Um, and, you know, I like big guys at middle linebacker, and he can run. Um, the thing that you knock on him is that he played at Tosa, so sometimes you can't really tell how good the talent was around him um, and that he's tackling. You can't always tell because it's at Tosa. But he definitely – um, passes the eye test because you want a guy that dominates that lower division like that and he actually dominates and it reminds me of a Brian Erlacher in that because of his size and this is a pass heavy league when you have a guy that's playing middle middle of the field and that has to run that that middle of the field defender um you know you know carry the seam route or the cover two beater down it was impossible throwing that ball over Brian Erlach. It was impossible. Yeah. When you're that big, it's very, very hard to get that guy, um, get that guy open. So it takes away a whole route in the middle of the field. Now, I don't necessarily know if he can deter speed there when it comes to like a, a number three receiver, but uh, it's very, very hard to throw that ball over his head to fit that window in between him and two safeties. I, I can see the cover two defense working massively with, with the guy like Xavier Collins. Now, um, the other guy that I love, Q, is a guy named Nick Bolton, number 32 out of Missouri. Like, he's a plug-and-play guy. He's not the biggest. He's not the fastest. But he shows up on tape. He led the SEC in tackles for the past two seasons. That's saying a bunch, right? That's impressive, um, yeah. And stops. That's very, very impressive. Um, that's a great division. And it's a lot of guys that play hard-nosed football. They run it right at you, a lot of teams. And for you to show up for two years in a row doing it like that, now. Running the four six and four seven, that's not lovable. But there are some guys that play so much faster, and he diagnoses the play better than anybody in the that did it in, in NCAA. So I like those two guys. Everyone's enamored with Micah Parsons. I don't necessarily know. Um, I love what I seen from him on tape, but he hadn't played. He opted out. I I, I have a I have kind of a uh, this is me personally. This has nothing to do with the kid. I can't count. I can't say the kid doesn't have great character or anything of that nature. But I don't like the idea of your team um, having an opportunity to play in 2020 and you opting out. And I doubt was it was it COVID or was it because I didn't want to hurt my draft status. I don't know. The guys like that, I kind of, you know, uh, gave them, oh, you know, not not the most favorable grade. So that's just me. But I like Nick Bolton and I like um, um, Zayvon Collins as well, Q. Yeah, and no. I think they would fit perfectly in the system. Zayvon would, would fit better because I think he's going to go in the second or third round, um, which, you know, that's where we want to pick that guy anyway. Yeah. I, I mean, I hope he's there. I, I hope Zayvon's there at uh, at – in the second round and we can get him because I, I do think he's going to be a tremendous player. And I, and I have to do a little bit more research on Bolton. Um, judging from what you told me, I mean, hey, listen, the fact that he led the, the SEC in tackles two years in a row tells me enough right there. It tells me that he knows how to find the ball. He knows how to hit. He knows how to tackle. And he's got great instincts. So I can tell all those things based off that stat alone in the SEC. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's enough for me. So, you know, I, 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 I'm cool with the, that. The, the great, the great ones, the great linebackers can diagnose angles better than anybody. The, yes. the great ones can, because usually there's a block out in front, and you have to make the the decision in a split second whether I can get around the block, I have to go through the block, or I can go under the block. Right, so it, you have to make that, and the great ones figure it out. They they get a path and usually they can run or they can diagnose it quick enough where they can make that decision. I've seen guys go opposite 
way on block so many times and end up making a play because they're so much faster recognizing than the offensive lineman. And that's what I see in Nick Bolton. I see, and that's the quality you have. And you see that same quality in Michael Parsons. Michael Parsons is because he can run, though. You know, when those guys can run, they change the angles. And, and, and that's the difference. It's not that he recognizes the play. It's just that he's so fast that the angle changes so quickly for the offensive lineman and they can't time him up. So, um, but at Very this true. level, the offensive linemen are not tricked as easy. So I don't necessarily know how much I love him. Nice, nice. Yeah. <laughs> so let me, let me, let me, let's go back to the the comment about the uh, the Tulsa being the, the lowest level. Okay. <laughs> All right. So Boise State, you know, they, they're, they're in our league. Oh, no. <laughs> so you saying Boise State is a lower level? We used to beat the brakes off of Tulsa, though. I'll tell you that. Well, well no, here's... you guys, you guys dominated your time too, <laughs> right? So, man, then you guys had a lot of guys drafted as well. There's a lot of guys that are playing on Sundays that came out of Boise State, and you guys changed the narrative, right? But ultimately, we don't know Boise State in the halls of history as you do in <laughs> Alabama or Clemson or whatever. And in the last 15 years, we've come to know Boise State because they have great marketing playing with the blue turf, so you know them, you recognize. <laughs> And then you got some great players that came out of it too, right? So then you got a guy getting married after a Statue of Liberty play. You have all of these things working in your favor, but it's more smoke and mirrors than actual meat on the ball. Oh, man, here we go. <laughs> here we go. <laughs> uh, but, but I will say, I will say this. I have no room to talk because we have the best reputation at the University of Michigan and hadn't accomplished more, not much of anything <laughs> in the last couple of years. So that doesn't mean anything. So um, Y'all get, uh, get back there. Y'all get back <laughs> eventually. One of these years, I don't know if it's in the near future or in another hundred years. It's, it's, not, it's not in the near future. <laughs> <laughs> uh, staff, you hurt my heart. <laughs> Twisted. So, and then... The second part of what I was going to say, which is funny, <laughs> was when you talked about um, Erlacher. So I played against Erlacher in college. And guess what? He caught a touchdown on me. Is that right? Erlacher <laughs> back, <body shoot>. Yeah, <laughs> dude. So back in the day, they used to, they on the goal line, they would split him out on the goal line, and they just throw up, just throw a yeah. uh, fade up to him. So, yeah, he, he caught one on me. He my, caught it oh, that was my man. sophomore year. Junior year, yeah. Uh, yeah, don't, don't, don't worry about it. He in the Hall of Fame. You got to touchdown in the Hall of Fame. Hey, there you go. I got, I got, <laughs> I got a touchdown caught on me by a Hall of Famer. <laughs> Defensive player. <laughs> Defensive player. But, hey, he was, he, was, he was one of the best that ever did. And he, he literally was. I, like, he had, he had the, like I said, he was 6'4", 6'5". He recognized the play. And he had a scheme that just worked in his favor, where those Absolutely. guys in front of him kept guys off of him. And he had a and he had one of the, the, the best two tandems. The guy that never gets enough credit is Lance Briggs. Lance Briggs was oh my a tackling God. machine, yes. a tackling machine. That one of the most out uh, overrated uh, or underrated um, will linebackers that ever played this game. He was a man out there. Yeah, them two dudes beast. were. Them two dudes knew how to get to. They knew how to get to the football. Uh, and and if you can get a guy like um, Zayvon Collins, right, that has that size and can recognize the play, man, and if he pans out, it, it, you limit people. You limit people in run game because of his size. It's perfect. And then you limit people in the pass game because of his size. It's perfect. So we'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. And so and then when you look at, like, when, you, when I looked at the tape last year of the Eagles, um, the, the linebacking core, Mm -hmm. And it, it was the same thing game after game, you know, zone right, zone right, zone left, zone left, boot. And then so what they do, what teams were doing, they're getting our linebackers running sideline to sideline, side and uh -huh. then they're booting off of it. And it's just scot, scot free. And so when you have a guy that – and you you want your linebackers playing aggressive. You want them if, – if it's a, a zone to the right, for instance, you want them coming downhill, you want them to play aggressively, right? Because yeah. if they're – sitting back expecting pass, you're going to get gashed all day on a run. But what you want is if they do take that false step, if they do rerun and it's a boot, put a foot in the ground and be able to turn and get out and get back in the coverage. And too often last year, I saw with our linebacking core, they would, they would come downhill, right. But when it was a boot, they didn't have the, I don't know if they, they didn't have the, the speed to really catch up speed. to the overall. Right. So mm -hmm. 
you got a guy like Zayvon in the middle or you got a guy like Bolton in the middle that can, you know, take that run read, but then, oh, shoot, it's a, it's a boot, it's a pass. Let me get back into my Let coverage. me get back, yeah. That makes a huge difference, and it helps the yeah. secondary because now they're not looking at these guys coming scot-free underneath, so now they can stay in their coverage, and then yeah. you shut the play down. So I do think that linebacker has been a – Linebacker and cornerback has been a, a, a position that they've really, the Eagles have really struggled on lately picking. And it's something that's got to be fixed soon. Yeah, lately, just you name me a <laughs> yeah. player. You, you name me a linebacker that's been the Pro Bowl since Jeremiah tried it from linebacker position. Yeah. Like, what do you mean lately? <laughs> like, yeah, you're right. You're right. <laughs> we, just, we, just, we just hadn't valued the position. Yes. And that's and and that's telling. Like some teams do, they value position. Like, look at the Bucks. The Bucks have two, like they just won a Super Bowl. Now I'm I'm the same guy that says, listen, we shouldn't be copycats. And I'm not saying that we be that, that we should be copycats, but you got two chances at linebacker. Very rarely do we play three linebackers in this league anymore, right? So right. you have you have two chances to play line, but you only play three linebackers and goal line basically nowadays, right? Guys, you, you just don't need that guy on the field. Most time, team would rather put an extra safety in that, that can do some linebacker type of duties. But you only have, you know, a few guys out there and you got to, one of them have to be a baller. Yeah. One of them, you need, <laughs> you, one, of, one of them has to be a baller. You can't just play with the middle of your defense. Um, you know, you, you, you can't, you can't keep playing with, with, um, with lesser talented players, yeah. you just can't do it, and um, and, and we've seen that. Now, 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 let's switch gears a little bit. Q, we're gonna we're gonna talk about um, Gannon's, you know, defense, mm -hmm. and we talked about this a few weeks ago, actually the last couple of weeks, right? And we talked about the, the potential cover two. We talked about the marrying of a different, you know, a few different styles, um, you know, um, with Zimmer, and then you know his his opportunity he had last year. Um, how do you think that our current corners are going to be able to handle? I don't think we have covered two type of corners. That's that. That's just me. I don't think that we have covered two style corners. I just don't. I don't see our corners being that physical in order to, to reroute. Um, do you think one of the guys in the draft is going to be that guy if we turn into a, a zone defense? Do you think that's Sertan that can do all of it? Um, but then do you want to limit a guy like Sertan because he's so good at man as well? Like, what do you think? That's a, um, <clears throat> let me look. Because 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 they're a zone guy, like, and, 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 and I'm going to explain this for the fans. Because there's zone guys, and then there's man, there's man corners. So I, I want you to, like, jog memory. Just take, take, take a, a stroll back with me and just think about, you know, National Football League. One of the best zone corners that the NFL has ever seen, a guy named Rondé Barber. Rondé yes. Barber was a beast at playing zone coverage. Whether he was outside, whether he was inside, whether he was at the safety position, he understood concepts, he understood leverage, and he was a great person to have in the zone coverage scheme. Mm -hmm. A guy like Josh Norman, if we talk about newer era football, is a great zone corner. He yes. made hay when he was with Sean Dermott in Carolina, and he got a big contract and, because he duped most of the National Football League into thinking that he was a man guy when he actually was only a zone guy. He has always only been a zone guy, but he got that big contract, and he's gotten exposed since then because you can't have – a lot of times both – the players can't do both. Um, so it's like, do are we choosing one or are we trying to get the best fit for both? What are we doing? Um. <clears throat> I think, I think if it's Sertan, it's the best fit for being able to play zone and man. Now mm -hmm. you can you can get away with, uh, you can get away with, you know, having, you know, one corner that's strictly, that's strictly a, a zone corner. Um, but mm -hmm. you're, every now and then you're gonna have to you're gonna have to play some man, right? So mm -hmm. that's the reason why I I like I like Sertan because he's a guy that. You he can play anything. He can play cover two. He can play zone. He can play man. He can man up. Um, you look at a guy. You look at J.C. Horn. I think he's a guy that's more of a a zone player. Like he's more of a cover two type body, cover two type corner. But then what happens in the game when you got to go cover three or go cover one, and you got to line him up man to man. So Sertan can do that. 
J.C. Horn, I don't know if he can do that for for a, a full game because now under Zimmer, Zimmer, Zimmer's defense traditionally has a lot of cover three as well, and you're gonna yeah. have to in this in this conference in the NFC East, you're gonna have to play some cover one, some cover three. You're gonna have to play single high. Um, they they run the ball well here, and so yeah. you know, um, and then you look at Farley. I think Farley is more of a uh, he's more of a man guy. Like a man guy of, of, of like, hey, you y'all y'all take care of business over there. I'm I got this guy right here locked up, and so, um, me personally, that's why I like Sertan the, the most is because he's so multifaceted. Like he can do so much, he can do so many different things, and he can play different coverages. And what that allows the 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 defensive coordinator to do is to be more creative, and that's what we need. We need more creativity on the defensive side of the ball because let's like we talked about it before. I mean. They study tape. I mean, these quarterbacks, they know as soon as they break the huddle, if you're sitting in the middle of the field, cover one, okay, we got – we. that's easy. Easy money right now. All right. Yeah, you talked about that. Got one-on-ones outside. So, um, you know, I I, I think Sertan's the guy that you got to get, get there. Um, there's some other picks later on. Like, I like – I really like Eric Stokes out of Georgia. Yeah. He's got tremendous speed and athleticism. He's, he can tackle. He can – so I can see him as a, a person that can come in and, and help as a, as a nickel back. Um, situationally probably step in if, 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 if someone's hurt. Um, you know, I, I like, uh, Newsom, um, Newsom, Northwestern. Northwestern. I think he's a, he's a, he's a very good player. He plays off the ball pretty well. Um, he, I think he's a little limited speed wise, but yeah. I do like his, I like his game. You always worried about, worry about a player coming out of Northwestern and when it comes <laughs> to speed and stuff like that, right? Because they're going to be a little bit limited, you know, so. That, that's just that's just my big picture view, and that's what I see. I just think that he's going to be a limited player, even though he he, he shows well on tape and has some success. But that success is in the Big Ten, and, and historically, the Big Ten is a little bit slower than most of the conferences, um, besides Ohio State, right? And um, so, so it, 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 eh, you don't, you just don't, you just don't, eh, you just, you know, you never, never be too hard on him. You missed one of the big names. We know this kid. What are we talking about? We Asante Samuel Jr. Well, we know this. Oh kid. shoot! Yeah, you yes, know, sir. Asante. Yeah, you know. Look, not to get off topic, but what I think is real cool is 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 all the guys. Yeah, Go ahead. all the guys we played against and grew up watching. Like their kids are are coming into the league now. Isn't that so crazy? It's cool, but yeah, isn't that crazy? Uh, <laughs> that's nuts, man. Cell phone no. Joe with a with a son is going to be drafted <laughs> in the first round. <laughs> Crazy. Son, I, 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 I wonder if Son was telling Son to say Samuel Jr., man, you better get that money. Oh, you know he did. <laughs> <laughs> you know he did. <laughs> get that money on three. <laughs> get that money. Listen, no, he's he's a uh, – I haven't – actually, you know, honestly, I have to be totally honest with you. I haven't seen a whole lot of him yet. Um, yeah. I remember watching him when he was younger. You know, Son used to always come in and show, show clips of his son show playing. Show clips of his son, yeah. He used to – his son, no, nah, his son used to hit harder than him. <laughs> well, and that's that's the thing. His 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 son is not his his son is a little bit different player than than, than his dad. Um, both of them have, both of them have good hands now. So, yeah. and those those are the things that see. That's what jumps out to me on tape, right? Um, measurables. He's smaller, you know. Yeah. Um, can he catch? How many? How many second? Like that's the big problem because yeah. it. it I want you to think about it. I love me some Brian Dawkins. I love me some Brian Dawkins. One of my favorite teammates that ever played. But if Dawk can catch the ball, Dawk would be leading the NFL, <laughs> NFL history because he was always in the right place, right? Yeah. But Dawk uh -huh. dropped so many interceptions, Dawg <laughs> on, right? You know what I mean? It's just, and, 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 it's, and, and, and we'll talk about this and have fun with it, you know what I mean? But a guy that can, a guy that can turn that football over, it's, it's different. Yeah. It's different. And yes, I I may not have the 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 four three speed, or I may not have you know the 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 jump off the tape size, but I can catch that football when I'm in position. Yeah. And if you're talking about a guy that's going to be looking at the quarterback, if we're talking about uh, 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 Gannon is going to play a Zimmer defense, I don't, I'm not I'm not opposed to Asante Samuels. I'm not opposed to it. if he's anything like his dad, and which on tape he's not as good as his dad, but. That doesn't mean that that, but but, well, hold on, hold on. Coming out of college, he is. Yeah. 
Now, that doesn't mean that that's going to translate into being a great pro. Um, and I wonder how much, you know, names are, are, are taken over too. You know, because they we have that pedigree and you hear the name Horn, you hear the name Sam, you hear the name Sertan, you hear the names and you're like, man, this kid is going to be good because of his dad, you know, you know, so all those things are in place. So I, I, I don't know, but I, I do, I do like him from what I've seen. Yeah. Um, um, Newsome, I've seen, you know, because because of the Big Ten. And so I, I wouldn't throw, I, I wouldn't impress at all. Yeah. But um, but that doesn't mean that he's not going to be a good player. Um, I'm just hoping that the Eagles don't wait to the third round to try to try to do this because that's 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 the going rate. We talking about Trevor Lindsay. We're talking about um, you know, Douglas. <laughs> we're talking about you know CJ Gaddis. We're talking about Curtis Marsh. We're talking about um Sidney Jones. We're talking like it's a lot of guys that they that that this team has has have messed up on. Um, yeah. you know, Jackie Guan, you like there's a lot of guys that this team has messed up on with corners. So um I think you kind of eliminate that fact if you go corner in the first round. And I think that the the one of the 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 surest pros, the sure thing in Sertan could be there and you should get them. It's absolutely, absolutely hundred percent. Yeah. And it's 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 hard, man. It's it's not easy drafting drafting good corners. Um yeah. There's so many variables that come into play. Um, and and that's why I think I don't want to say the Eagles were spoiled, but you know, when you mm-hmm. had a, a system for so long, you had Jim Johnson and you had, you know, McDermott and, and Spagnola, and you had all these great football minds that could hide other hide players' deficiencies or, you know, use them in the right way to, to kind of get the most out of them. I think that's one of the most underrated things about, um, you know, Jim Johnson and the way he did things was that, you know, I mean, we had, I don't know if you remember Keith Adams, right? You yeah. remember Keith Adams? Mm-hmm. Well, he, was was mostly, mm-hmm. he was mostly a special teams guy, but, um, you know, he ended up, you know, starting a few games and playing well because Jim and, and Spagnola and, and Ryan Rivera, all those guys, they figured out the the, the best way to, to use what we had. And mm-hmm. so you kind of get spoiled in the sense of like, hey, you know, this guy looks like a Sheldon Brown. Let's draft him, right? Or this guy looks like a Lito Sheldon. He's got speed like Lito. Let's let's draft him. Um, this guy, he's got the size of dog. You know, let's draft. So I, I do think that maybe they got the – the organization maybe got a little bit spoiled thinking that, Hey, we were able to pick these guys, but no, it, it takes, you gotta, you gotta pick the right guys, but you also have to have the right coaching staff to, to, to develop them, understand what their deficiencies are, understand what they're good at, and then have them kind of build up what they have and use in your system the right way. And so, um, those I, those I those were Hecker's picks back in the day. That was yeah. some, that, that was some that was that's when when Coach Reed and, and Hecker was doing their number in the draft. That there's a lot of good players that them dudes yeah. pick. Um, then, yeah. Yeah. So just 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 throwing that out there. We're gonna we're gonna transition in Q. Let's okay. transition to what the fans have asked us, man. There's okay. some people that are asking us some questions about routes. There are some people that are asking us some personal questions. Um, someone asked me a question about Tony. Um, Florida. He's a, you know, um, I believe he's number one. He's like a, a receiver. Cardavius uh, Tony or something like that. Yeah. What, what, I can't remember his first name, but I did, I did break down his tape because a fan asked me and I wanted to comment to that fan. Um, what I see from him, I don't necessarily see a number one receiver. I see a guy that's a gadget guy. And when you think about gadget players, you think of Reggie Bush, you think about Peter Ward, you think Percy about Harvin. Percy Harvey, you think about all these guys that lit college football up, DeAnthony Thomas, all of these guys, but they didn't have the same success in the National Football League because you have to have substance in the National Football League. So the route runners usually do a lot better than the guy that's the explosive run after the catch guy only in college. So is are those skills very valuable? Yes, but guys just don't miss tackles that much in the National Football League. Um, and yes, will a guy dip under a tackle and make a play here and there, like Curtis Samuel from Carolina? Yeah, they're going to make a play here and there. But those guys have been, you know, disappointments so far because they don't have the tact to run routes. So I wouldn't put my eggs in that basket. However, if you put 
him in a in a great offensive coordinators that uh, brain like a, that has a, 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 a just a plethora of like tools mentally. You know, a guy like Sean Payton, a guy like you know um, the enemy. Uh, yeah, you know, guys that yeah, the enemy. You know, Coach Reed or um mcdaniels up in new england you give you give them a guy like that they can do some things with him because they're going to bring out the best they'll create matchups but just to have a guy like tony to line up every receiver it's just not happening not in this league it just i don't care how quick and fast you're on college it just don't happen like that what was the kid that got drafted at Hodge because he was quick and fast tavon T- tavon austin like it just don't happen in this league you can be explosive it just don't happen like that you got to be a route in yes. order to do that and be that. And and that leads me to that second question uh, or the question that the fans asked, and I'll go last. Um, how how is it um show, show tell me um what's it like or or can you can you walk us through um good technique as a defensive as a defensive back, like shooting your hands, all of those things? Because there's a fan that asked that question along those yeah. lines. Yeah, so we got the question, um, and it was a good question. Um guy uh, on, on social media uh he said hey can you kind of kind of walk me through um what is the perfect coverage and in a nutshell so in a nutshell it, it kind of depends like what type of coverage we're talking so if we're talking let's say there's essentially there's there's maybe what six seven eight different types of coverages there's press man-to-man there's off man-to-man there's Quarters coverage, which is you divide the field into four pieces. There's quarter coverage. There's cover two coverage, which is um, half. I mean, there's wow. there's tons of different ones, right? So, and ideally, what I would like to what I would explain is to me the the ideal coverage. If we're in press, all right. First of all, it starts with a, your alignment, all right. So whether you have to understand your leverage, and leverage is if I'm lining up on let's say i'm lining up on jason avant right and i'm playing man to man and i'm out wide at cornerback and i'm my idea in, in press coverage is to make sure i disrupt the timing that's the the moment the, the most important thing for me as a as a cornerback disrupt the timing that means i got to do whatever i can to make sure jason does not get into his route because everything is based off timing so let's say it's a the quarterback has a five-step drop right so and Jason's running a go route. <clears throat> so if he has a five or let's say a three step drop on that third, that third step by the, qu- the quarterback, he's got to be ready to let go, let the ball go in the air because you got the, the pass rush and all that stuff. So my my main thing is to when that my main goal is when that quarterback gets to his third step, he's not ready to throw the ball because Jason, the timing is off. OK, so my first thing I want to do is I want to get in the right leverage. So I want to take away any quick inside release by Jason. So I'm going to I'm going to split Jason and I'm going to take my hand and put right down the middle of Jason. All right. So they like in football, they say inside eye. Right. So I want to line up with my chest, the middle of my chest on the inside eye of Jason. That's the first mm-hmm. thing. So proper alignment. So I'm taking away his inside. The first thing I want to do get my eyes low. I want my eyes on Jason's hips. I don't want my eyes up because he, he got a lot of wiggle. He, <laughs> he going to shake me <laughs> if I'm looking up there, right? That's, that's false right there. I want to look, have my eyes low. All right. First thing I want to do, and it's easier to do with, if we're in person, but um, first thing I want to do is take my, my inside foot and step. I, I personally, everyone does it a different way, but I like to take my inside foot and take a little half step just to kind of balance myself up. I'm, my eyes are still low. I'm just reading his first his first move. Okay, so now he feels me that I'm taking away his inside. So he's going to try to what they call um, what do you guys call it? Attack my uh, leverage, right? Yeah, try to attack, attack my... your leverage or stem or whatever it is. I'm trying to get a clear release. So yeah, the the worst thing that a defensive back can be doing is end up if I'm taking away the inside and I'm lined up inside. The worst thing I can do is allow Jason to become head up to me. So if he comes any far in, inside, I need to take a step further in the inside. So I need to keep my leverage. So he's going to attack to my inside. I got to keep my leverage to the inside because the second that I'm head up with him, now he has a two-way go, meaning he can go right or he can go left, and I do not want that. So now I'm holding my leverage on the inside. He's going to jam. He's going to you know stem me. 
then he goes to his release. Once he goes to his release, it's go time. So ideally, I want to be able to feel what his release is, feel if he's trying to go outside or if he's trying to come inside. I would like for him to go outside because I'm holding inside. So once he goes in his release, I step at a 45 degree angle with my left foot backwards. And at the same time, I want to mess up his timing. So I want to single hand jam and I'm, I'm aiming for right under his armpit, his chest, chest plate right here. I want to hit right there on the shoulder pads and get him to kind of stumble a little bit, get him to kind of freeze a little bit, just whatever I can do to kind of make him pause, make him uh, get off his, his get off time, get mm -hmm. off his time. Once I do that, nine times out of 10, if I'm able to get him to, sh to chop his feet a little bit and get a little jam on him, I've done my job. Because nine times out of 10, unless you have a, a great quarterback, the timings should, should be off enough to where I can run. Now, after I get my little jam, if he's running up the field, now I got my eyes low on him. I'm just running with him. I'm running with him. 10, about 10 to 12 yards. If he's still up the field, I'm thinking, okay, after 10 to 12 yards, he's probably going to run a go route. It could be coming back to a post route. He could be going to a corner route or some other type of route. But generally speaking, after about 10 yards, I'm pretty much locked in on it's, well, it, it, say you get somebody that, that that kind of you know plays against the you know don't 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 run the lines and stuff. It's hard for DBs. It's hard. It's hard to stick a guy you know that that can run a four 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 three, and you got a back pedal. It's just hard in this league, and it's made for you. Can't touch the quarterback. You can't touch him after five yards. It's tough for defensive backs. So um, we don't envy you guys at all. Um, and and I think that those guys are like guys that can do it really well. It's it's they're some of the best athletes that play any sport. It is that it's just a very, very hard thing to do. And on the same wise, the guy asked me, you know, um, along, you know, along those lines, like what's the, you know, I guess perfect or walk, walk me, walk you through, or, um, the, you know, I guess the perfect route. And it all depends on what the route is. I just think you, as a receiver, you think about, um, you know, what you're trying to do. And for me, that was to do, it was to look at the leverage of the defensive back, number one. Okay, I want to know what he's trying to take away from me because if I know the coverage and what type of man to man, because there's there are so many different types of mans, there's so many different types of threes and fours. Every coverage that we name off, we call one, three, five. There's so many different variants of that, yeah. right? Where there's modifiers, where it changes with this and that. And the more you know as a receiver, it kind of makes you a better player at the line of scrimmage. Receivers make their money doing two things, catching the football and getting open versus press man. That's how you make that's how you make money in this in this in this league. If you can catch the ball consistently, make contested catches, and you can get open versus press man, they can't get you out of this league because there's not enough guys that learn how to do that. And what makes you more effective when it comes to catching the football, my thing was is that. If I beat you at the line of scrimmage, my catch is going to be easy. And I'm going to create so much separation by the time you close for them from the fans. eye, it's going to look like I made a contested catch, but you weren't around me at the entire route. So I had clear sight lines when a guy is running next to you and there's guys, you know, and he's, you know, impeding your progress the entire time you're jostling with him. It messes up your equilibrium. It's hard for you to locate the ball. There are so many different things that can go wrong because that guy is so close to you. But if I can get that guy away from me at the beginning of the route, I got a clear vision to, to the quarterback in my route. It's like catching routes on there. So even if he closed late, I, I still have already seen the ball already. So, to, so with that being said, based on his leverage, I'm going to release based on that. If I know Q, he just talked about having inside leverage, I know that he doesn't want to let me get inside. So I can run straight at Q and get jammed further outside because he because I didn't attack his leverage. If I attack his leverage, Q's going to do what? He's going to he's going to panic and say, oh, my 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 leverage is being compromised. So therefore, I'm going to take another step. So 
I made him move out of my way so I can get vertical. So now I have a clean and clear path. The guys that understand this are better at playing receiver. Guys will run forward knowing that he has an inside shade and that guy isn't threatened. So he ends up jamming you further than you wanted to go. But if you run at him, you open up the gate so you can run forward. Just those little things like that make you different. So whatever leverage he has, if he has outside leverage, I'm not fighting with him. The coach always says on offense, you know, um, you know, you, you know, release towards your route because it's on the quarterback time. I don't live by that model. That model gets you cut in the National Football League. If you release one way and you run that route every time, uh, uh, run in that direction every time, the guy's going to undercut the route and you're going to get end up getting a lot of picks on you. So I just best release every time. Whatever the defensive back is giving me, I'm going to take that. Right. If he's getting playing outside and I got an outside breaking route, I'll, I'll make it up at the top of the route. I'll make him think that I'm going inside because I didn't threaten him outside at all. If I threaten him outside, he's going to think I'm going outside. So I may speed release inside and then shake him at the top. So um, it's kind of hard to explain. I wish I can like simulate that to you. So I get a clear, clear release. I take whatever he gives me at the line of scrimmage. And at the top is where I make my money. That's where the head fakes come. That's where the head fakes come in. That's where the stutter comes in in the middle. That's and the best route runners have a sense of when the DB is running full speed or not, knowing when he's sitting or not, all of those things. And you should be able to feel that within route. And every route is different. If a guy is sitting on me at the top, I may stutter to make him, you know, want to break first, and then I speed up again. Now he's like, oh, it's a double move, and I stop. You know, because he's sitting on me and I got to get him to to honor. It. Or if a guy's at the top and I'm running and I, I'm at 80 percent and I'm like, oh, he's he's pacing pretty good. And I'll say I'm gonna go 100 so I can stop. I get his RPMs to go up and then I can stop. I just don't want to stop with him running next to me. You know. Um, I just don't want to stop with him running next to me. I want to get his RPMs up so I can swim and pass. So there's so many different ways to run a perfect route. And it's kind of an unfair question based on the leverage, based on the coverage, depends on the route, if the route is perfect or not. So that's the best way I can explain it. Um, the guys that are shiftier, and if you're shifty and strong, you got an advantage. If you are fast, you got an advantage because you don't need half the stuff I just told you. If you're really fast and you can catch, because you can speed release now, and, and the guy can't touch you at five yards, right? But you still need to know coverage. Right. So because if you don't know coverage, you gonna end up with concussions. <laughs> yes. If you don't know coverage, you will end up with concussions. A lot of guys are like, man, the quarterback keep throwing that guy in the stuff. No, the dude that's running that route do not know coverage. And he's looking at the quarterback when he shouldn't be looking at. Listen, I'm going to tell you, people are like, man, Jace, you so tough. You take those hits over the middle. That's because I knew what coverage it was. And I knew if I can get down. Or if the, the hit may look hard to you, but it, yeah. it wasn't hard to me because I knew where he was going to be. A guy that's just running through a defense blindly and don't know coverage and just not paying attention, like, you're going to get yourself hurt. I remember the loudest hit I ever heard um, was Dante Robinson on Deshaun Jackson. And he oh, was yes. on, oh on, on, and I remember that. And I said, I remember that he was running a, he was running a shallow cross. And the yep. rules on a shallow cross is – if you're running across the field, you don't look at the quarterback until you're ready for the football, right? And if you know a zone, you know right when you get past the middle linebacker and you get in between a hook defender and the flat defender, you sit right there in cover two. You don't look back. Deshaun didn't know the coverage because he wasn't supposed to be on that route. He runs across like it was man-to-man -man looking at the quarterback the whole time. The quarterback being young throws him right into Dante Robinson and almost ended that man's career. And mm -hmm. I'll never forget that because I'm like, dude, that's the perfect example of when a person does not know coverage and the, the harm you can do to your body because you didn't know. So it, it's very, very important to know. Yeah, I remember that hit, man. <laughs> that was I was scared for both of them. Like that yeah. was Dante and Deshaun. That was crazy. Yeah, me, I'm, a, me, I'm like, man, this dude is dead. <laughs> I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, that dude's dead out there. <laughs> Jason, oh, you're going to NFC. <laughs> like, all right. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. Man.
But Q, this has been a, a, another great episode. I, I always enjoy myself with you, brother. And uh, I'm looking forward to next week. Again, thank you to Jeff. Thank you to the fans. Thank you to Adam inside the Verge platform. Everybody that's watching our show, we're having fun breaking down this tape. We're having fun breaking down this these 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 players that are coming up in the draft and just talking about football with you guys. We love the Birds, and uh, we're looking forward to this each and every week. Q, you want to sign out with the fans? Yeah, man. Hey, love it, man. Having a great time. Uh, like Jason said, man, just keep keep coming up with them questions and and and. Whatever stories you want to hear, anything, man, just just uh, let us know, man. It's been a lot of fun. Appreciate it. And as always, man, much love. Much love. Inside the Birds platform on Wednesday at 6. Inside the Birds platform, Wednesday at 6. YouTube, Amazon Music, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. We're all over the place. Check us out. Let's do this again. Holla at yes, y'all next week. <laughs> Q&A. <laughs>